Field eyes. The date is April 20th, the year 2000. We find ourselves on the island of Pulau Tiga in the South China Sea. It's currently the final day of production on a new show for CBS called Survivor. What you're looking at here is a lot of things. It's the culmination of a life-changing adventure. It's the end of the inaugural playing of a fascinating new game. It's the fallout from a betrayal, a particularly brutal one at that. And in a few months' time, when this airs on television to an audience of more than 50 million people, it will become arguably the most iconic moment in the history of reality TV. But wait, who is this woman? Who are these people and what are they doing? Why is there a treasure chest full of money right there? And perhaps most importantly, why does any of this matter? In order to answer those questions, we're gonna have to start on day one, which for TV audiences in the US was May 31st, 2000. The day Survivor first premiered and announced itself as a new force in the world of television. It was the beginning of what is now referred to as old school Survivor, which is, in my opinion, the very best of the genre known as reality TV. It was nothing real. You were real. That's what made you so good to watch. Reality TV first came about in the 1990s and early 2000s, a time when American television trends were undergoing a major shift. By the onset of the 90s, the most important TV viewing demographic, young adults between the ages of 18 and 34, was largely occupied by Generation X. These were people that had grown up in a time that was both much more cynical and much less naive compared to the world their parents had been raised in. Thus, many of them couldn't relate to the idyllic family life that was depicted in the sitcoms of the 1980s and 90s. Instead, they turned to shows like The Simpsons, which ironically felt more real and relatable than something like Full House or Family Ties. Gen X was more interested in watching the murder trial of O.J. Simpson than they ever would be in watching the crime procedurals that had dominated primetime networks for years. Over the course of the 90s, TV programmers reacted to this change in demographic by shifting their attention towards completely new types of shows, and in the case of reality TV, an entirely new genre. One where the shows are, in theory, about real people in real situations. In the 80s, seeing a drug bust on TV probably meant you were watching Don Johnson do his thing on Miami Vice. But 10 years later in the 90s, it more than likely meant that you were watching the real deal unfold as it actually happened on Cops. From its earliest days, two things have been true about reality TV. First, reality TV has always been accused of being trashy, low effort, and at times, blatantly fake. And second, despite that reputation, reality shows have always had a broad appeal, which often leads to big time numbers in the ratings. This potential for huge audiences is the reason channels like History have completely pivoted towards reality programming over the course of the past two decades. Survivor itself has pretty much always maintained a strong viewing audience over those same two decades, with the most recent seasons averaging around 7 to 8 million viewers per episode. Make no mistake, those are impressive numbers, especially for a show that's been on for more than 20 years, but they are nothing compared to the ratings juggernaut that was old school Survivor. <laughs> In the old school days, Survivor wasn't just a relevant show with a consistently strong audience like it is today, but rather, it was an honest-to-god cultural phenomenon. Survivor was everywhere at the turn of the millennium, to the point where just appearing on the show made you a C or B-list celebrity. The fever pitch around Survivor in the old school years simply cannot be replicated. It was a completely different show from a completely different cultural moment. When I say old school Survivor, I'm specifically referring to the show's first seven seasons. Borneo, The Australian Outback, Africa, Marquesas, Thailand, the Amazon, and Pearl Islands. Many fans of the show would probably also include the 8th season, Survivor All-Stars, as part of Old School Survivor, but I personally see All-Stars as its own thing, kind of like an old school epilogue. Nowadays, the Old School era seasons are amongst the least popular and are usually found towards the bottom of most fans' season rankings. 
They are often criticized for being slow and boring compared to their modern counterparts, but I assure you that that is just a common misconception. The old school seasons may not have the heart pumping advantage plays or the near constant strategy insights of the newer seasons, but in my opinion, they have so much more that makes them the very best reality television ever made. This video is part one in a series that will cover the history of Survivor's old school era, both the show itself and the subsequent massive cultural reaction. Along with that, the series will also highlight the reasons I personally prefer old school Survivor over the majority of newer seasons. Now, I want to say right up front that this isn't a case against modern Survivor, but rather a case for old school Survivor. Of course, I will be making comparisons between the two, but that doesn't mean that I think the current version of the show is bad. In fact, I love Modern Survivor. It's still one of my absolute favorite shows, but I am particularly fond of the original seasons. Part 1 will only cover one season, that being the show's very first season, Survivor Borneo. And that's because the story of Old School Survivor is heavily front-loaded. There's just so much to talk about here at the beginning, including this. But again, in order to understand what's really going on here on day 39, we first have to understand everything that came before it, starting with day one. The concept for Survivor was originally created by the influential British TV producer Charlie Parsons sometime around 1994. The show was initially pitched to ABC, where it was turned down by the network's chairman, Stu Bloomberg. Subsequent pitches to CBS and NBC were also unsuccessful, however, Lauren Corral of the Fox network loved the idea. Corral began developing the show by recruiting the man who would eventually go on to spearhead Survivor's production, a rising star producer named Mark Burnett. Today, Mark Burnett is amongst the most powerful and successful people in the television business. Beyond Survivor, his list of producer credits is full of smash hits, including Shark Tank, The Apprentice, The Voice, and Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? I should note that there's also some straight up garbage on that resume, like My Dad is Better Than Your Dad, and Bully Beatdown, but those missteps are few and far between. Most everything with Mark Burnett's name on it has been successful. He got his start with the 1995 adventure race series, Eco Challenge. Eco Challenge, which is widely considered to be the first ever reality competition show, ran for 10 seasons between 1995 and 2002 across multiple channels, including MTV, Discovery, and ESPN's X Games coverage. Hey, he on X Games mode. Burnett's experience producing Eco Challenge was the main reason that he was recruited for Survivor while it was still being developed at Fox. Survivor's development changed hands from Fox to ABC following Disney's purchase of the latter in September of 1995. Two years after the Disney acquisition, executives at ABC chose to let their contract with Parsons expire, effectively passing on Survivor for the second time in less than two years. Parsons decided to license the rights to Survivor's concept to Swedish TV network TV4. From this came Expedition Robinson, the first version of the Survivor format to ever air on TV. Parsons then sold the show's American rights to Mark Burnett, who was emboldened by the success of Expedition Robinson in Sweden. Burnett made some tweaks to the format seen in Expedition Robinson in order to create a show that would have both a heavier focus on interpersonal conflict as well as a much more cinematic presentation, but that's something we'll talk about later on. Burnett successfully pitched the revamped Survivor concept to CBS's chief executive Les Moonves in November of 1999. The show went into production from March 18th to April 20th of the next year and was slated for a premiere date a little more than a month later on May 31st. On Wednesday, May 31st, Let's do it! we're stranding 16 real people on a remote island. CBS didn't exactly have the most faith in Survivor before the show premiered. This was due in part to the fact that it had been impossible to shoot a pilot episode for Survivor. A pilot is essentially a prototype a test episode that serves as a proof of concept for any potential TV series. In a typical year, each of the major networks will order roughly 20 pilots, and of these, maybe 6 or 7 will end up being turned into full-fledged series. Pilots are recognized as a cornerstone of the TV development process, but producing one for Survivor just wasn't an option. 
Due to its very nature, a season of Survivor has to be shot all at once. Making a single episode would be pointless, as it wouldn't be at all representative of what the show as a whole would turn out to be. No pilot meant that CBS was going in blind on a show that was already a huge risk, as nothing like this had ever been done on American television before. Thus, Survivor was slotted into CBS's summer schedule, the relegation zone for shows that the network doesn't feel comfortable placing in the vital fall and spring lineups. Despite this lack of confidence, the first episode of Survivor had a considerable amount of buzz around it even before it aired. First, CBS had put together a strong marketing campaign for the show that's main focus was placing ads on fellow Viacom channels, MTV and VH1, channels whose main viewership was the much coveted 18 to 34 demographic. And beyond that, in the weeks and months leading up to Survivor's premiere, there was this rumor that people were actually going to die on the show. This can most likely be traced back to an episode of The Howard Stern Show from January of 2000, in which Stern speculated on a new show he had heard was being developed by CBS. A show in which 16 people would be left on a desert island until only one remained. It's thought that this misinformation attracted a considerable number of viewers to the first episode, and so a fair few people were genuinely shocked when they tuned in for the premiere only to discover that these people would not be fighting for their lives, but instead that they would be playing a game. Subtle reasons. Not sure exactly what they are. A standard game of Survivor takes place over the course of 39 consecutive days. The number of players in the game varies from season to season, but for all seven of the old school seasons, the game begins with 16 players, also known as castaways. Before the game starts, these castaways are divided into two teams, which are known as tribes. So, in the case of Borneo, we have the Tagi tribe and the Pagong tribe, named after the beaches upon which each tribe is living. Every three days constitutes what is known as a round in the game. A typical episode of Survivor covers one round, most of which are made up of three key events. A reward challenge, an immunity challenge, and a tribal council. The reward challenge is exactly what it sounds like, a competition in which the tribes compete against each other for some sort of prize, usually food or items that can make their lives easier. Later on in the round comes the immunity challenge, another competition but this time the winners receive safety in the game, while the losers head to tribal council that same night. Tribal Council is essentially an elimination ceremony where each member of the tribe casts a vote for the player whom they believe should be eliminated from the game. The votes are then read and the player who receives the most votes is sent packing. Tribal Council is the climax of any given round of the game and therefore serves as the end segment of almost every episode of the show. After a certain number of castaways are voted out, the two tribes merge into one and the individual portion of the game begins. In Old School Survivor, the merged typically occurs when 10 players are left in the game. Following the merge, some reward challenges and all immunity challenges are now individual, which means that only one player is safe from the vote at every post-merge tribal council. Starting at the final nine, each player that is voted out becomes part of the jury. Jury members return as observers for all subsequent tribal councils, and this is because at the final two, it is the jury who ultimately cast the votes that determine who wins the show's million dollar prize and the title of Soul Survivor. This is one of the key dynamics that makes Survivor such a fascinating game. In order to win the game, you need the support of people whose dreams you just helped to crush. Survivor is, and always has been, a game of social politics. It's a game centered around person-to-person -person relationships and convincing others to act in your self-interest as opposed to their own. This is more than just a test of survival skills. It's also a test of social skills. Here, it's the impressions you make on the other castaways that determines your fate. There seems to be this popular sentiment online that old school seasons lack this strategic gameplay and social maneuvering. That just isn't the case, and while sure, the old school seasons certainly had less of a focus on gameplay and strategy talk compared to the more modern seasons, the game has always been at the core of the show. For me, the difference is summed up by this. New School Survivor is focused on the game the people are playing, while Old School Survivor is focused on the people that are playing the game.
That focus is clear even from the earliest scenes of Borneo's first episode. The show opens with an event called The Marooning. The Marooning is a set piece that starts the game by immediately throwing the castaways into a stressful situation. In the case of Borneo, the marooning took the form of a two-minute scramble for food and supplies aboard the Manahari, an Indonesian schooner that ferried the castaways from mainland Borneo to Pulau Tiga. There was then a four-hour-long paddle-slash-swim to each tribe's respective beach. It is during this paddle that the audience is first introduced to the show's cast. Through narration over staged shots from outside of the game, we learn the name, occupation, and hometown of each castaway. This introduction segment is a staple of Old School Survivor. The segment is like a roll call that allows the audience to at least have some vague idea of who these characters are before their story really begins. The cast introduction is something I think the show has really missed ever since the segment disappeared for good starting with Season 9. It's straightforward and effective, and while of course you're not going to remember who everyone is just based on these small introductions, it humanizes the cast and gives us a brief look at what these people might be like in their regular lives. This is one of many small details that makes Old School Survivor what it is. These 16 people were chosen from a pool of more than 6,000 applicants in a casting process that involved audition tapes and multiple rounds of interviews. The original philosophy behind Survivor's casting was to find, quote, fairly ordinary people, unquote. And while there certainly are some exceptions to that, that's exactly what these people are, ordinary Americans from different walks of life. And of course, the show's producers were well aware that these different backgrounds would inevitably lead to conflict, aka good TV. And they wouldn't have to wait very long after the start of the game for that conflict to arise. But that's to be expected when you're dealing with someone like Sue Hawk. Susan Hawk, a truck driver from Wisconsin. Sue is kind of like the answer to the question, what would happen if a background character from the movie Fargo was cast on a reality show? Sue's a hard worker who won't hesitate to voice her opinion, while at the same time, she also has a streak of mischief and cunning under that neighborly redneck first impression that she gives off. From the very first second the Tagi tribe made landfall on their beach, Sue was ready to take action and get to work setting up the camp. This take charge approach would immediately land Sue in a disagreement with a man in a tree. A man named Richard Hatch. But I've got the million dollar check written already. It's that kind of cocky attitude that makes people really hate your guts, so that's the, that's the kind of thing I've really got to keep uh, under wraps. Richard Hatch, a corporate communications consultant from Rhode Island. Rich is to Survivor what Sean Connery Bond. is to James Bond. By that, I mean he yeah, is the Bond. original face of the franchise. Sure, there might be others who have come and claimed that title in the years since, and you might even personally prefer those others over the original. But just as Connery will always be the iconic original face of Bond no matter who else assumes the mantle of 007, Richard Hatch will always be the OG Survivor icon. I'll definitely have a lot to say about him throughout this entire video and probably the later videos in this series too. He's complex to say the least. I guess it would make sense if we begin with why he's even in this tree in the first place. At the time he was cast for Survivor, Rich was a corporate trainer who specialized in team building and group dynamics. In other words, Rich is a communicator. And so when Toggy first arrives at their beach, Hatch wants to slow down, perch himself up in a tree, and talk about the big picture. Who everyone is, and why each one of them has come to Pulau Tiga. And of course, sitting around and talking things out before the camp is even set up does not fly with Sue. The corporate world ain't gonna work out here in the bush. This disagreement on how to approach the opening hours of the game is often cited as the moment Survivor's production team knew they had a successful show in the works. It's a textbook example of Survivor as a social experiment. Here are two strangers from different walks of life who have been forced to work together. This all might seem insignificant more than two decades after the fact, but this is truly the first big memorable moment of the show, and it's only fitting that that moment would be focused on these two. Because Sue Hawk and Richard Hatch are the main characters in the story of Survivor Borneo. Of course, there are plenty of other people who factor into the way this tale unfolds, but it's Rich and Sue that are at the center of the narrative from start to finish. They might seem like polar opposites, but by the time Borneo is finished airing, they'll share at least one thing in common. They'll be utterly despised by millions of American TV watchers. 
Millions is certainly no exaggeration either, even when only referring to the audience for Survivor's debut episode. Even the most optimistic of CBS executives would have never predicted that more than 15 and a half million people would be watching as Survivor's first episode came to a close, with 63-year-old Sonia Christopher becoming the first person ever voted out in the history of Survivor. Let's put the gravity of that number in context. Programming executives at ABC, the network that had turned down Survivor twice while it was in development, recognized that the show had the potential to be a serious hit for rival network CBS even before the show's actual premiere. In a deliberate effort to sabotage Survivor's premiere, ABC shuffled its own lineup, making sure that Survivor would have to go head-to-head -head with the most popular show on TV. Millionaire debuted a full year before Survivor in the summer of 1999. It was initially an event show. Instead of airing once a week over the course of a TV season, Millionaire aired on consecutive nights for two weeks straight. The combination of this special, limited format and a media controversy that stemmed from the show's fourth episode in which a contestant was incorrectly eliminated was enough to attract a monumental summer audience for Millionaire. A second, massively popular two-week special in November cemented the show's status as TV's top dog. In reaction to this success, ABC president Bob Iger made the decision to go all in on Millionaire, making it a regular series that would air three nights a week. Wednesdays, the night Survivor was set to air on, was originally not one of those nights. However, the hype for Survivor in the weeks leading up to its premiere would cause ABC to add a fourth episode of Millionaire to their lineup in an effort to stifle Survivor before it could even get off the ground. As the ratings came in the following morning, ABC and parent company Disney were shocked by the results of their millionaire move. When the dust settled, Millionaire had won the night with an audience of 16.8 million viewers. While that was enough to top Survivor's 15.5 million viewers, Millionaire had lost where it mattered most. Say it with me, the 18 to 34 year old demographic. Word. It's hard to get across just how big of a deal this was. 15.5 million is a bonkers total for a TV debut, especially for a show with a risky, never-before-seen concept. For context, the final episode of Game of Thrones had a viewership of 13.61 million when it aired in 2019. That means that Survivor's first episode brought in nearly 2 million more viewers than the series finale for a beloved show that had been building its audience since 2011. This comparison also illustrates just how enormous the popularity of million Millionaire was during its first year. And so the fact that Survivor was managing to nip at the heels of Millionaire after just one episode certainly came as a seismic shock to ABC, but executives at the network were convinced that Survivor's big performance had been a fluke, and that the show itself was nothing more than a lowbrow stunt. You cockroaches wanna play rough? Okay, I'm reloading! cried Disney's CEO Michael Eisner as he ordered another special Wednesday night episode of Millionaire to again go head to head with Survivor. Big mistake. This time, numbers were even worse for ABC. Much worse, in fact. Millionaire had lost more than 1 million viewers compared to the week before, while Survivor's audience had ballooned to more than 18 million. Young people in particular had abandoned Millionaire specifically to watch Survivor. This was an utter embarrassment for ABC, a show that was looked at as a cultural sensation just weeks ago had been reduced to yesterday's news. Without the reputation as being TV's biggest show, Millionaire would fade into the pack of other TV game shows over the next few years, and can now be looked at as one of the worst mishandlings of a mega hit in TV history. So just how did Survivor get such a huge audience so quickly? Well, there's quite a few answers to that question that require us to take a deeper look at episodes 2 through 6. The pre-merge section of Survivor Borneo is best described as a tale of two cities, or beaches, or tribes, or whatever you want to say. The point is, I think the best way to go about this section of the show would be to split it up by tribe, starting with our old friends at Tagi. Most of the Tagi tribe was not well liked by America at the time Borneo aired. They were looked at as the scheming bad guys, whereas Pagong was seen as the fun-loving good guys. However, there was one exception to this dislike for Tagi. A pretty huge exception at that. 
because while America loved to hate Richard Hatch and his arrogance, they couldn't help but be utterly captivated by his friendship with Rudy Bosch. Rudy Bosch, a retired Navy SEAL from Virginia. I don't even know what MTV means. Rudy was 72 years old when Borneo was filmed. Despite his age, he was clearly one of the most capable people out there. His impressive military career spanned 45 years, many of those spent as part of the elite Navy SEAL team too. This guy was renowned amongst Navy SEALs for his physical fitness, so I guess it's not that much of a surprise that he was able to handle Survivor in his 70s. The American public loved Rudy. like really loved Rudy. People were tuning into Survivor just to see this guy and to hear his one-liners. Then we might kill him. Is that doing you a favor? He had a bluntness about him that I think a lot of people at the time found really endearing. Although now some of his more famous quotes haven't really aged all that well. Like so many people on reality TV shows, Rudy was cast to fit an archetype. The crotchety, old-fashioned veteran who would inevitably come into conflict with his younger, less traditional tribe mates. In fact, pre-production footage from the casting process makes it clear that production was fully expecting Rudy to clash with Rich, based solely on Rich being gay. Would you vote against someone just because he was gay? <laughs> it's okay, we're just looking for honesty here. Yes. And maybe in a different scenario that would have been the case, but not here. Instead, these two not only became allies within the game, but they also forged a friendship which would become significant not just for the show, but for American culture as a whole. In Rudy's life outside of Survivor, he did not associate with people of other sexualities. Yet, during his first few days on Survivor, he found himself impressed by Richard's leadership and outdoor skills. He's one of the nicest guys I ever met, and he's good at what he does, you know, he's got leadership ability. So much so that all of a sudden it didn't seem to matter that Rich was gay. By day three, Rich and Rudy were thick as thieves. This close friendship that formed on national TV between the grizzled ex-Navy SEAL and the chubby intellectual gay guy was truly a massive deal in the year 2000. I mean, back then there were hardly any depictions of LGBTQ individuals on TV, and those few exceptions often played to stereotypes. With Survivor, there was no script or writers that could confine Rich to those usual stereotypes. Instead, he was just himself, and as such, Rich's time on Survivor became one of, if not the first, nuanced depictions of a gay person on American TV. The same goes for his friendship with Rudy. Relationships like this were nearly unheard of on TV at the time. The dynamic was so fresh that people came to the show just to see it. Again, a lot of Rudy's commentary on the friendship is really dated, but that doesn't change the fact that his willingness to set aside his preconceived notions and legitimately allow himself to grow close to Rich really did open a lot of people's eyes at the time. Although now it seems ridiculous that praise was heaped on Rudy simply because he tolerated someone who was different from him, this relationship still carried a ton of symbolic weight for acceptance in the year 2000. Today, this friendship and the depiction of Richard as a whole still hold genuine significance in the history of LGBTQ representation on TV. Just about the only person who wasn't a big Rudy fan was his fellow Toggy tribe mate, Stacy. And so after Toggy loses the episode 3 immunity challenge, Stacy wants Rudy to become the second member of Toggy to be sent packing. By episode 3, the writing was already on the wall for a Rudy downfall. Borneo's first two episodes had already proven that the early stage of the game was basically open season on senior citizens. As I already mentioned, Toggy took out 63-year-old Sonia in episode 1, and during the show's second tribal council, Pagong voted out their oldest member, Bibi, who was 64 when the show filmed. And to be honest, it makes perfect sense to take out the old people early on, as the pre-merge in Old School Survivor is heavily focused on the strength of the tribe. Not only that, but Stacy personally found Rudy abrasive and hard to be around, and so before tribal, she used her experience as an attorney to successfully lobby the majority of the tribe to vote against the veteran. But when the actual votes are revealed, it's Stacy whose torch ends up being snuffed. Oh, must be Rudy and his old guy charm managed to sway the vote and we just didn't see it, right? Objection! 
It turns out there was a lot more going on in the lead up to Stacy being voted out than was revealed by the show's edit. Roughly one year after Borneo aired, Stacy, who, let me remind you, is an attorney, brought a lawsuit against Survivor's production company. The lawsuit claimed that some of Survivor's producers, including Mark Burnett, had convinced two members of Toggy not to vote for Rudy and instead to put their votes on Stacy. The reasoning for this was twofold. First, like I already mentioned, production was well aware that Rudy was the purest form of TV gold, and so naturally they'd want him to stick around for more than just the first three weeks of the show's run. And along the same lines, it's alleged that production was worried the show would lose its older audience if all the old castaways were eliminated right at the beginning. That adds up too, as the next oldest castaway after these three was Rich, who was by no means old in 2000 at the age of 39. In a court deposition that's easily accessible on the internet, Dirk Bean, one of the two Toggies that was allegedly coerced into voting against Stacy, claimed that while he was not directly told to vote for Stacy, production did heavily imply that it would be in the best interest of his personal game to do so. So yeah, production clearly tampered with the first season. But come on, they tamper with just about every season. It's just that usually they don't get caught with their hand in the cookie jar and they definitely have never been as direct as they were in trying to turn the vote on Stacy. Following this lawsuit, the contract players sign when they get cast for the show was changed to make it crystal clear that Survivor is not a game show. Instead, it was classified as a non-scripted drama. Remember that term. They did this because after the quiz show scandals of the 1950s, there were strict rules put in place that applied only to game shows, and it's those rules that made them vulnerable to Stacy's lawsuit. Now that Survivor was legally no longer a game show, the producers were free to influence the show going forward after Borneo however they wanted to. A lot of people like to think of Survivor as a quote, pure game, but the thing is, it isn't pure, and it never has been. A lot of the time Survivor is really unfair, and the reason for that is that Survivor will always be a TV show first and a game second. What makes for a fair game doesn't always make for a good TV show. Now, this in no way means that Survivor is rigged or is even close to being rigged. There are simply way too many variables at play in the game of Survivor for it to be rigged, but what I am saying is that production has and always will influence some of those variables. You really think that they didn't originally plan to have a tribe swap in Palau? Chances are they had one planned, but they canned it so that we could all watch Oolong burn. Why? The same reason they stepped in for Rudy. Because it was good TV. After Stacy was gone, the producers didn't have to worry much about Rudy's safety in the game, and that's because in episode 5, Rudy became a member of the first ever official alliance in Survivor history. Forming an alliance is one of the basic elements of the strategy within Survivor, so needless to say, there have been dozens of them throughout the years. Big alliances, small alliances, successful alliances, and god-awful ones too. There's alliances within alliances, and fake alliances, you name it. They are a constant on the show. The first alliance we actually see on the show is made up of four players. Rich, and his new pal Rudy, as well as Sue, who brought along her own island friend, Kelly Wigglesworth. Kelly Wigglesworth, a river guide from Las Vegas. Kelly was the youngest member of the Toggy tribe, and while she as a person wasn't all that interesting on the show, she went through a lot and was ultimately integral to the way Borneo played out. Her inclusion in the Alliance, which I'll be referring to as the Toggy Four from here on out, was mainly due to her relationship with Sue. The two bonded quickly despite the 16 year age gap between them, and at one point, Sue even likens Kelly to a sister. Their friendship is made all the more meaningful when we learn that Sue's real life best friend was killed years ago, and that on some level, Kelly has helped Sue to fill the void left by that loss. I ain't gonna f her. I'm not burning her. Remember how I said that just about everyone hated Toggy? Well, that was mainly because of the Alliance. At the time, there was no established way that a game of Survivor was supposed to go. And so when these four players band together as a block of votes, it was looked at as cheap, and some people even went as far as to say that it was cheating. Some of the other players in the game thought it was immoral to use an alliance to gang up on someone at Tribal Council. Nowadays, players who are duplicitous and cutthroat are loved 
been celebrated by the audience. But at the onset of the show, the opposite was true. The players who were the most well-liked were the sweet, nice people who played fair, in quotes. The Toggy 4 was indeed the brainchild of Richard Hatch, and yes, it is technically the only alliance seen in Borneo. And because of that, people love to say that Rich was the only person playing the strategic game in Survivor's first season, but that just isn't true. In fact, the majority of the cast was playing strategically, just not always the type of strategy that we typically think of. It just so happens that Rich's strategy of forming an alliance that actively targeted other threatening players was the most successful, and their Therefore, it was emulated in future seasons to such a degree that it became what the game of Survivor is all about. Rich certainly played the best game of anyone in Borneo, but to say that he was the only one playing would be doing people like Sue, Jervis, and Stacy, amongst others, a huge disservice. I mean, Stacy literally tried to put together an alliance long before Rich did, all the way back on day three. But it just didn't really come together, and for that reason, we really only got hints of this gameplay in the show's edit. Rewatch Borneo and you'll see exactly what I mean. Plenty of the original castaways were savvy enough to play the game, just not morally willing to play Rich's game. You know, I, I consider myself extraordinarily ethical and moral, and uh, this has absolutely nothing to do with this. I, it sounds like sheer stupidity to me when somebody says, oh no, I'm not going to build an alliance, and I hope they wouldn't do that either. It's our old buddy Dirk Bean that becomes the first victim of the Toggy 4 in the show's fifth episode. With only one elimination remaining after this one before the merge was set to take place, Toggy was left in a do or die situation. At this point, the two tribes had traded immunity wins back and forth each episode. This meant that if Toggy were to lose the episode 6 immunity challenge, they would have just four members to begong six. At that point, Toggy would be sitting ducks waiting to be taken out one by one at the merge. If a Toggy member was going to have any chance to win the game, they would need to secure one more challenge victory against America's tribe, Pagong. For those who are less familiar, the Pagong tribe consisted of BB, Ramona, Joel, Gretchen, Greg, Jenna, Jervis, and Colleen. For the first two episodes, most of Pagong's airtime was dedicated to BB and his complete and utter inability to integrate socially with his much younger tribe mates. And so it's not until after BB is voted out at the end of episode 2 that we see the Pagong that everyone remembers. Pagong is the fun tribe, the big happy family that Mark Burnett described as behaving similar to what you might expect from college students staying at a beach house. I'm far from the first person to make this observation, but there's definitely a comparison to be made between the Pagong scenes and Quentin Tarantino's idea of hangout movies. A hangout movie is one that places the emphasis on spending lots of time really getting to know the characters, as opposed to focusing on big events and plot movements. In basic terms, hangout movies are characters first and plot second. A few of my personal favorites in this subgenre would include Before Sunrise, Dazed and Confused, and Napoleon Dynamite. There's practically no scheming or strategy talk in the Pagong scenes. All of that is pretty much exclusive to Toggy. Instead, what we get are slices of island life, interactions and conversations that don't really have anything to do with the season's grand narrative, but rather ones that allow us to really get to know the Pagong characters. I've used the term character a few times already when referring to the contestants on the show, and I should probably explain that a little further. While Survivor is by no means fake, in fact, as reality shows go, it's probably just about as real as they come, we aren't necessarily seeing these people as they actually are in real life. Instead, what we're seeing are highly edited versions of them in a very specific circumstance. Or in other words, we're seeing the versions of them that the show's producers want us to see. In the old school era, the show's priority was to tell a season-long story and thus through the editing process, the castaways become the characters within that story. This attention to narrative and storytelling is one of the things that I think makes Survivor's old school seasons so special. Each of the seven seasons tells a story that is distinct from the others. This gives each old school season a ton of personality, something that cannot be said for the seasons of the past seven or eight years. With the newer seasons, the show's focus has completely shifted away from storytelling and towards the game. Now, I will admit, that shift in focus has made for a show that can be really exhilarating at times, but it has also come at the expense of character development and portraying a satisfying narrative. And sure, maybe that's not what you're looking for with Survivor, but still, in newer seasons it feels like we hardly get to know anything about these players other than their strategies, which means we're less invested when they get voted out. 
The old school seasons create a ton of emotional investment through their use of strong character development. This makes the eliminations feel a lot more significant. We aren't just watching strategy robots and pretty people lose at a game. Instead, the old school boots tend to feel like losing a friend, even if that friend was someone you only saw once a week for an hour at a time. And, you know, that you never actually really met them, but you feel like you did, and that's the point. In my opinion, these clear and strong narratives also make the old school seasons extremely rewatchable. I find newer seasons less rewatchable because they often lack that strong central story. Instead, the strength of new school survivor lies in its individual moments, advantage plays, clutch challenge wins, and blindside reveals. All things that are fantastic on the first watch, but lose a certain amount of their appeal on a rewatch when the shock and hype factors have both dissipated. Maybe I'm alone on this, but when I revisit these moments, it's always in YouTube compilations, whereas I tend to revisit full old school seasons pretty frequently. There are so many details in these early seasons that you can easily miss on a first watch through, and that is undoubtedly the result of the care and attention to setup and payoff that was put into the editing because of the focus on storytelling. Borneo's pre-merge is the perfect example of the two ways in which Old School Survivor tells its stories. The Toggy segments, as we'll soon find out, are all set up for the big picture payoff that unfolds in the post-merge, while as I've mentioned, the Pagong scenes offer character development and conjure emotional investment. These two storytelling techniques come together at the merge as we start to get a deeper look at the Toggy characters, while at the same time the Pagongs are swallowed by the season's main narrative. And to make the circumstances of the merge even more fascinating, Toggy did manage to win that critical sixth immunity challenge, sending Pagong to Tribal Council, where they voted out Joel. This meant that the tribes would indeed come together with equal numbers from each, which set the stage perfectly for a moment that would permanently change the course of the show. That moment came at the very end of episode 7, which is one of three episodes in Borneo's post-merge that I believe are amongst the very best that the show has ever produced. These three episodes, The Merger, Old and New Bonds, and The Final Four, have everything you could possibly want in an episode of Survivor from both a narrative and game perspective. This climactic moment at the end of episode 7 is the perfect illustration of that claim. The merge vote is always one of the most chaotic points in the game, and in Old School Survivor, it often sets the course for the remainder of the season. Both of those things are true in the case of Borneo, especially the former as I don't think it's a stretch to say that this vote result is flat out the most chaotic that we've seen on the show even to this day. Let's set the scene. Greg won immunity and therefore was safe, and that's really important because throughout this entire episode it's made very clear that he is the first target of the Toggy 4, and this is mainly because Rich has recognized Greg as a threat. Now that Greg was off the table, the audience was completely in the dark as to who might go home due to the wonderful decision made by the show's editors to go directly from the immunity challenge to tribal council. This made it all the more shocking when Gretchen, whose name had never been brought up as a target for the entirety of the episode, was eliminated in a bonkers 4 to 1 to 1 to 1 to 1 to 1 to 1 vote. Nobody outside of the Toggy 4, including the audience, had any idea that this was coming. It's me. Gretchen was well liked by literally everyone in the game, including the Toggies. The Pagongs saw her as their leader, mainly due to her advanced wilderness survival skills. While she was technically a preschool teacher when she applied for Survivor, Gretchen used to be in the military where she actually, no joke, taught people how to withstand torture. In terms of likability and qualifications, Gretchen probably deserved to be out there more than any of her fellow castmates. But as the Toggy 4 made blatantly clear with this vote, Survivor is not about who deserves it most. This vote changed the entire mood around Survivor, both in the game itself and around the show as it aired. It was seen as the moment a fun adventure show went bad. If forming an alliance was looked at as unethical, then using it to pile the vote on someone like Gretchen was downright evil. Gretchen was the first castaway to be eliminated who had genuinely done nothing wrong. In fact, she was taken out for the opposite reason. She was too much of a threat. At the time, fans were completely floored by Gretchen's elimination. Out of absolutely nowhere, the Axis of Evil had taken out the leader of the good guys. Now, if this were to occur in a modern season, it would be looked at as nothing more than a pretty solid move to blindside the leader of the opposition. But back in the day, it was like a brutal crime had been committed on network TV. You could look at Gretchen's exit as being the death of Pagong as we had come to know it. 
The head of the fun, laid-back Beach House tribe had just been cut off, leaving what's left of Pagong to flail and bleed out over the course of the next four episodes. From here, the writing was on the wall, as the Alliance would indeed pick off the rest of the former Pagong members one by one. This culling of a former tribe after the merge is what Survivor fans now call a Pagonging in reference to the fate that befalls the former Pagongs in these episodes. Pagongings are usually thought of as predictable and boring, but Borneo proves that they don't necessarily have to be a bad thing. Just because the pecking order is obvious doesn't mean that the way in which the players in the majority navigate picking off those on the outside can't be interesting or downright fascinating like it is here in Borneo. Take episode 9 for example, which is officially titled Old and New Bonds, but is known to many fans as J for Jenna. Now that we've reached J for Jenna, it's time I finally mention the one Borneo player whose name I've yet to utter during this video. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Sean Kenneth. Sean Kenneth, a neurologist from Long Island. Sean is definitely a candidate for the title of biggest goofball to ever play Survivor. From Super Bowl 2000 to the beach bowling alley to his, uh, unique approach to voting at Tribal Council. I am not really employing any strategy. Just about everything we see Sean doing can be described in one word. Dumb. Sean's actions on the show make a lot more sense if you know why he wanted to be on Survivor in the first place. You see, Sean was under the impression that he was born to be a star, and that Survivor would be his big breakout. He basically treated his time on the show as a demo reel that would hopefully jumpstart an acting career. Just like plenty of other people from Long Island, this guy really did think he was the next coming of Jerry Seinfeld, and so he did everything he possibly could to come across that way on Survivor. Everything he did, and everything he said, was all part of this shtick. Of course Sean did want to win the game, but it was far more important to him that he was well liked by the TV audience. So as to not tarnish his image as the nice guy, Sean attempted to completely avoid the ethical problems that are inherent to the game of Survivor by implementing his infamous alphabet strategy. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. Hey, you know what letter comes after I? J! Right, and whenever I think of the letter J, I think of all my friends whose names begin with the letter J, like... Baby, baby, baby. Following the merge, Sean openly announced that for the rest of the game, he would be voting in alphabetical order, which naturally meant that in every post-merge round, the other players always knew exactly who Sean was going to vote for. Getting back to episode 9, the narrative seemed to be building towards a downfall for Richard. He gets a particularly harsh edit here as multiple confessionals, mainly from Colleen, are dedicated solely to bashing him. On top of that, Rich was vulnerable for the first time since probably day three. Despite his pension for making enemies, the Alliance and Rich's ability to provide food for the tribe had kept him safe up to this point. But things had changed by the time of this episode. Other players had learned how to catch fish, and a crack was now festering within the Alliance. From the very start of the merge, Kelly had been steadily growing closer to the former Pagong women. After sending Gretchen home, Kelly began to have second thoughts about the Alliance, and by the time episode 9 came around, she had fully defected. With Kelly flipping on the Alliance, the numbers were now there to blindside Rich, and after he lost the immunity challenge, so was the opportunity. On top of that, it just so happened that the next tribal council was on the same day as Rich's birthday, which would only make his demise sweeter for those who couldn't stand him. There was only one problem. R comes after J in the alphabet. That's right, with Greg having been voted out in the last episode, Jenna would be next up on Sean's alphabetical hit list. Sean wasn't worried about Jenna's safety though, as he explains in one of the least self-aware confessionals of all time. If I'm gonna be the swing vote, which I don't think I will be, then I won't vote for her, obviously. He follows this up at Tribal by claiming that his vote against Jenna won't matter whatsoever. And I think she's a safe vote tonight. If I, if I was felt she was in jeopardy, I would think twice at the very least of casting her. What Sean doesn't know is that he has been involuntarily drafted into the Alliance to fill the spot left by Kelly. Or at the very least, his vote has, as Rich and Sue capitalized on the constant within the equation, that being Sean's alphabetical vote, by placing the Alliance's three remaining votes on Jenna too. Sean is completely dumbfounded as the final vote that sealed Jenna's fate and spoiled what would have been a top tier blindside is revealed in an all time great survivor moment. The last vote. Jay or Jenna? 
Timmy, you need to bring your torch over. This delivery of the final J for Jenna vote is, in my opinion, the first great moment for Survivor's host, Jeff Probst. I haven't mentioned Jeff up to this point, but obviously he's a huge part of the show. I'm probably going to have a ton to say about him, so I've decided that he will be getting his own in-depth segment in one of the later videos in this series. For now, I just want to highlight this as the moment where Jeff really finds his feet as the host of the show, with some great dramatic timing that perfectly caps off this episode's self-contained narrative. Jeff's delivery here is yet another one of the countless details that come together to create Old School Survivor's cinematic presentation. Now, I want to say up front that I know this isn't something a lot of people care about when they critique a season of Survivor, but the way the old school seasons are shot is one of my personal favorite things about them. Everything about the presentation of the classic Survivor seasons was deliberate, from the artistic framing to the use of visual metaphors to the planet Earth quality nature shots. It was all done purposefully in an effort to create a TV show that had a film look. Survivor's early seasons can be flat out gorgeous at times, and in this regard, Borneo is just the tip of the iceberg, as some of the seasons I'll be talking about in later videos can really crank the visual appeal up to 11. Look, right across the board, oh. 11, oh, 11, and most of 11. This cinematic approach to television production was born from Mark Burnett's absolute fascination with a little horror movie from 1999 that you may have heard of. I'm so scared. <laughs> There are very few movies that have had the same level of impact that the Blair Witch Project had following its release in July of 1999. It's a simple yet ridiculously effective movie that follows three film students as they venture into the back country of Maryland's Black Hills in order to shoot a documentary about a local legend known as the Blair Witch. Made on a budget of less than $500,000, The Blair Witch would go on to gross more than $248 million at the box office, making it one of the most profitable movies of all time. The Blair Witch Project single-handedly revived the found footage genre, which of course is a big deal, but Blair Witch's real claim to fame was its downright genius marketing campaign. Most of the marketing for Blair Witch was done on the internet, mainly through the movie's official website. The marketing campaign was centered around convincing people that the footage used in the movie was real, that these quote-unquote characters in the film were actual people that had really gone missing while shooting a documentary, and that what was being shown in theaters was literal found footage of the events that led up to their disappearances. The actors were listed as either presumed dead or missing on the movie's official IMDb page and never made appearances before the movie's premiere. Fake interviews and police reports about the disappearances were released on the website, and they even went as far as to create a feature-length fake documentary called Curse of the Blair Witch that aired on the Sci-Fi channel in the weeks leading up to the film's release. There was a ludicrous amount of thought and coordination put into tricking people into believing that this was real footage, and based on the box office numbers I just mentioned, I'm sure you can tell that that effort paid off. People turned out in droves to see the Blair Witch, many of whom believed that what they were seeing was actually real. Mark Burnett, like millions of other people, was utterly captivated by the Blair Witch Project when it came out. So much so that Burnett has actually claimed that this movie was the main inspiration for Survivor. He noticed that Blair Witch was essentially just raw documentary footage that had been shaped into an emotional narrative through editing. In essence, Survivor is the exact same thing. Hundreds upon hundreds of hours of relatively boring footage that has been edited into a riveting story, or as Mark Burnett often described it, an unscripted drama. Because he saw Survivor as a cinematic story, Burnett also wanted to employ filmic visual techniques that were hardly ever seen on TV in the year 2000. I will admit that the attention to visual detail isn't exclusive to old school Survivor, but it was definitely at its peak in the show's early years when Burnett was more involved. I actually think that Borneo is clearly the weakest in terms of visuals amongst the old school seasons. Borneo's look is unique. It's usually described as feeling rather unpolished and raw. If we're talking in cinematic terms, then the easy comparison for Borneo would be to a documentary, while the other six old school seasons have looks that are more akin to fictional adventure dramas. The visual details are still there in Borneo, they just aren't presented as well as they would be in seasons to come. Confessionals are clearly less edited as they often include plenty of ums, pauses, and in Kelly's case, needlework for some reason. 
Challenges aren't shot or edited in the clearest manner, and some of the camera angles used at Tribal Council are really wonky. But still, there is a certain charm to Borneo's less flashy presentation, especially if you've already seen other seasons before watching this one. I know I've said this a lot, but the cinematic quality of Old School Survivor, whether that be the visuals, the editing, or the storytelling techniques, is something I will be going deeper into in the other videos in this series. I wanted to make sure I mentioned this aspect of the show in the first part, but like I said earlier, Borneo really is just the tip of the iceberg for this topic. After Jenna's departure, the Alliance was able to march to the end of the game, as they took out Jervis and Colleen in episodes 10 and 11 respectively, and then followed that up by Mercy killing Sean's game at the Final Five. And thus, the Toggy Four became the Final Four. Borneo's finale is a piece of television history. It's arguably the most important episode of Survivor ever, it's probably the most iconic episode ever, and it is far and away the most watched episode of Survivor ever, in terms of debut audience at least. Borneo's audience swelled steadily as the season progressed, reaching 28.67 million viewers for its penultimate episode, but that is a drop in the bucket compared to the season finale, 51.69 million viewers. That is an astronomically huge number, especially when you consider that Survivor built this audience in just 13 weeks. For comparison, the series finale of the massively popular sitcom Friends had an audience of 52.5 million, but that was the culmination of nearly an entire decade on the air. Survivor was nearly able to hit those same heights after just three months. It was this utterly massive performance in the ratings that gave Survivor its true phenomenon status. And let me tell you, those 51 million viewers got quite the show from Borneo's concluding chapter. All seven of the old school finales are known for being some of the best episodes in the series, and a big part of that is their pacing. Old school finales waste no running time and pretty much always get straight into the action. Borneo's finale is no exception, as the challenges and tribal councils come fast and often. We see the first ever tie in Survivor history at the Final Four Tribal Council. Our first tie. Kelly and Sue vote against Rich while he and Rudy put their votes on Sue. Now, this is speculation, but there was allegedly no tiebreaker procedure in the rules of Survivor at this point, and so apparently the solution was to have the two players that didn't receive votes, Kelly and Rudy in this case, vote again and again until one of them flipped. Ultimately, it was Kelly who flipped her vote, and therefore it was Kelly who sealed Sue's fate in the game. It might not look like it now, but Sue was absolutely devastated by this betrayal, and we'll see the ramifications of that shortly. But for now, we gotta talk about the best challenge in all of Survivor, Hands on a Hard Idol. I personally have always loved endurance challenges on Survivor, and Hands on a Hard Idol is the most basic form of the endurance challenge. It's simple, all you gotta do is stand on a perch and keep your hand on an idol. This is purely a test of willpower. It all comes down to who wants it more, and that's why I think it's the perfect final challenge for any season of Survivor. Hands on a Hard Idol or something very similar to it was used as the final challenge in six of the seven old school seasons, which is certainly a contributor as to why I like them so much. Hands on a Hard Idol is the perfect encapsulation of Survivor's motto, outwit, outlast, outplay. The outlast part of that is pretty obvious, but the outwit and outplay pieces come from the opportunity to make a strategic move that this challenge provides. Richard Hatch took full advantage of that opportunity by pulling off what is still one of the most shrewd moves ever seen on the show. Two and a half hours into the challenge, Rich decides to give a speech. I'm thinking I'm probably never gonna outlast you, Kelly. I'm gonna hope that either one of you just recognize what I've done to get here. Si, senor. I wish you both luck. Rich! Rich recognizes that his optimal move would be to throw this challenge, and this is for a few reasons. First, Rich was well aware that he stood zero chance of winning against Rudy in the final two. As the figurehead of the Alliance, Rich was not popular amongst the jury, whereas Rudy was well liked by just about every juror. But that also meant that Kelly was in the same boat. She had practically burned everybody on the jury at some point in the game. So Rich knew that his only shot to win would be against Kelly. 
However, he also knew that if he broke his promise to Rudy, that being that the two would never vote for each other, he would surely lose Rudy's vote and maybe others too based on that betrayal. Therefore, throwing this challenge would be the smartest thing Rich could do. By doing so, he effectively guaranteed that he would be in the final two, because if Rudy were to win, he would keep his promise and vote out Kelly, and if Kelly were to win, she would have to vote out Rudy because she stood no chance against him in a jury vote. And although it was on a technicality, this move would also keep Rich's hands clean as he wouldn't have to cast a vote against Rudy. In the end, it was Kelly who won this final challenge, and as Rich predicted, she took out Rudy at the penultimate tribal council. The following night, Rich and Kelly faced the jury at the final tribal council. Here's a quick rundown on how the final tribal council works. Each finalist gives an opening statement. It's here where they plead their case as to why they deserve the million dollar prize and the title of Soul Survivor. After the opening statements, each juror then gets a chance to personally address the finalists. The jurors can ask questions or just make statements, and after every juror has said their piece, the finalists then make one last statement before the jury votes to determine who wins the game. And so we've finally arrived at the big moment. The moment that this entire season and this entire video have been building towards. Sue Hawk was the last of the jury members to address the finalists. She had no questions, only statements. She started by calling out Rich for his arrogance and his unwillingness to admit to his faults while also commending him for the effort he put into the game. Sue then turned to Kelly and proceeded to unload 39 days worth of emotions onto her. But Kelly, go back to a couple times Jeff said to you, what goes around comes around, it's here. You will not get my vote. My vote will go to Richard. And I hope that is the one vote that makes you lose the money. If it's not, so be it. I'll shake your hand and I'll go on from here. But if I were ever pass you along in life again, and you were laying there dying of thirst, these pretzels are making me thirsty. I would not give you a drink of water. I would let the vultures take you and do whatever they want with you with no ill regrets. I plead to the jury tonight to think a little bit about the island that we have been on. This island is pretty much full of only two things, snakes and rats. And in the end of Mother Nature, we have Richard the Snake, who knowingly went after prey, and Kelly, who turned into the rat that ran around like the rats do on this island, trying to run from the snake. I feel we owe it to the island's spirits that we have learned to come to know, to let it be in the end the way Mother Nature intended it to be, for the snake to eat the rat. Kelly's betrayal at the final four had clearly been devastating for Sue. It wasn't so much that Sue had lost the game, but instead it was the way in which she had lost that had cut Sue so deeply. As I talked about earlier, Sue and Kelly had become best friends as they went through the entire ordeal that is Survivor together. They had planned for weeks to take out Rich at the final four or final three, but when the moment finally arrived, Kelly turned her back on Sue and cut her loose. Hell hath no fury like a scorned Sue Hawk. Sue's speech is still intense to this very day. It comes across with the full force of someone who really has been betrayed by a close friend. These words, however harsh, were sincere, and because of that, people really felt them at the time this finale first aired. This speech, which is now known as Snakes and Rats, was a massive TV moment probably the biggest in the reality subgenre. It was so brutal and so personal that it became a flashpoint in the argument on whether or not TV was going too far. It became synonymous with reality TV as a whole to the point where for years people conflated reality shows with harsh mean behavior like that scene in this speech. It was so visceral that it managed to hang a gray cloud over the entire subgenre of reality TV. Snakes and Rats is the emotional climax of Borneo's story, and it is the perfect cap for the first season. A transcendent, iconic moment that also happens to tie the season's narrative together in a perfect bow. Everything had built up to this point, and then Sue tore it all down in a blaze of glory that made damn sure that Survivor Borneo would go down in TV history. And speaking of TV history, or at least Survivor history, for the first and only time, the winner was revealed right then and there at the final Tribal Council. In the end, the result was indeed as nature had intended. 
Richard the Snake had eaten Kelly the Rat and won a million dollars in the process. He was speechless, overwhelmed. His life had changed forever, and so had American television. It might seem just a tad abrupt after like an hour, but this is the perfect place to leave off until part two. Because the fact that Richard Hatch of all people had won Survivor Borneo would be one of, if not the biggest influence on how the game would ultimately unfold in Survivor's second season, The Australian Outback. <laughs> Hey everyone, it's me, Peel Dyes, or Spencer, or whatever you want to call me. If you made it this far, well, first of all, thank you for watching. Um, maybe consider hitting like or subscribing even. But yeah, if you made it this far, you're probably a pretty big Survivor fan, so let's talk shop on the rest of the series. Uh, this video, the, uh, the Borneo one, was a little bit more of like an overview on the series itself and how the show works, whereas the next two parts are going to be more into like the nitty gritty of what's actually happening within the game as it evolves. So right now, the plan for part two is to cover the fallout from Borneo, so Survivor Mania leading up to Australia, and then season three as well, Africa. So we'll go over all that in the next part. Not sure when that's going to be out. It might be a while, and I'm thinking there will probably be at least one non-Survivor video in between uh, this one and the next one. But yeah, so that's kind of what I'm thinking right now for this series. And um, like I said, I'm really glad if you made it this far. Thank you for all the support, and I'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.